It's five minutes past ten, and uh, we welcome Derek Shelmerdine back for the, uh, the, the the last hour of our three-hour extravaganza. And uh, what happened in December over the years? Well, Derek, what did happen in December over the years, and why did we play that record? Well, for two or three reasons. One, it's got to be my idea of a, a Christmas single that was released on the 23rd of December, 1966. But the other thing is, it's often thought it to be a, a Vietnam protest song, but it actually wasn't. I mean, it was written by Steve Stills, but it was about the Sunset Strip riots in uh, the summer of 1965. And basically, on the Sunset Strip, there was a um, nightclub, and the police uh, decided to close it down, and the, uh, the local uh, population, young population, took a bit of a dim view of that, and uh, said riots um, occurred. And Steve Stills thought, well, that would make a great song. And I think it did. I love that song. How long did the riots go on for? Any idea? It was it was going on the whole thing. There was protests and stuff going on for oh, a number of days. Right. And they, the police finally sort of closed it down. Yeah. Arrested a bunch of people. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so the, the club didn't didn't last. Then. No, 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 no. It was it was wet the way the sixties really things yeah. sort of came and went. Young people rebelled, and uh, life went on. But it, it was a, an interesting time. December, you've got your... If you've got a birthday in December, you, you're in some illustrious company. Uh, from the Doors, Jim Morrison, the Lezard King, um, 8th of uh, December. John Densmore, the drummer, 1st of December. And Jimi Hendrix Experience, um, Chaz Chandler, the manager, 18th of uh, December. And Noel Redding, the bass player, 25th. And if you're a Monkees fan, uh, a red letter day is the 30th of December. In 1942, Mike Nesmith was born. In 1945, Davy Jones was born. And if anybody remembers uh, or hankers after the early days of um, Coronation Street and the days of Ina Sharples and Hairnets, Davy Jones famously played uh, Ina Sharples' uh, grandson uh, for a couple of episodes. Uh, way back at the beginning of the um, early 60s. Do you when... know something? I, I've never really watched... Car I don't watch any of those things. And uh, uh, But I do have this overriding memory of a kid, of uh, as a kid, rather, of Ina Sharples, oh. uh, wearing a hairnet and a long coat and those sort of flat black shoes. Absolutely. And uh, who was her sidekick? Minnie Caldwell. Minnie Caldwell and it, yeah. Martha Longhurst. Oh, no, I don't remember them. that. I can just yeah, remember those two. In the snug. That's, that's all I can remember about yeah. Coronation Street. And I don't think I've seen it since. Oh, it was it was a great year. It's it's a good. I mean, I must confess, I'm a big big Coronation Street um, fan. Mm. I was actually um, featured. Was in your a, neck of the woods? I guess. Isn't oh, it? that's right. Yeah. Right, Manchester. Yeah, um, but a lot of fun. Actually, do do you remember the Davy Jones episodes? Uh, no, I don't. I don't remember actually seeing that because at that time, of course, you didn't realise he was. Davy Jones, and he was only in for, I'm not sure exactly how many, but it was only a handful of um, episodes, so he was just another bit actor, as it were, um, passing through. It's only later you think, oh, I wish I could find an episode of that somewhere to uh, see what was going down. And if we think about things going down, on the 15th of December across the years, um, the first time uh, ever to hear Elvis has left the building was said uh, by Horace Logan at the Louisiana Hayride. And of all the expressions that have um, come into common parlance, I think that's got to be one of the best. And John, John Lennon's uh, War Is Over campaign uh, was kicking off on the 15th of December in 1969, uh, used, using the slogan, War Is Over If You Want It, Happy Christmas from John and Yoko. And, of course, he had the... Um, uh, single associated with that, which was released in America in '71 and the UK in '72. I've never quite sure, never quite found out why there was a year between them, but uh, that's how they were they were released. And the Beatles themselves had their fifth uh, Capitol album uh, on the same day, actually the the 15th, and they were still doing lots of covers. This is 1964. Uh, they had Chuck Berry's Rock and Roll Music. Uh, Dr. Feelgood and the Interns, also known as Piano Red, Dr. Feelgood, uh, with the original version of Mr. Moonlight, and Honey Don't, uh, Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby, from Carl Perkins. Carl Perkins uh, claimed the credit, writing credit on both of those, and, uh, as he has done with lots of others, but you can actually trace Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby back to 1936, and Rex Griffin. Now, if you actually listen to it, it is remarkably similar. Uh, but 
a lot of that was going on in the uh, 50s and well the 50s mostly uh, where people took a, a song and modified it a little I don't life was quite so litigious in those days and it was a good time to have birthdays as well um, on the 15th Dave Clark uh, Dave Clark five uh, drummer they were the second most successful uh, British band in the um, British invasion of America, 64 through 66. And Dave Clark was quite a... He, he might not have been the greatest drummer in the world, um, but a great guy. Um, and he, very astute businessman. He bought the rights to uh, Ready, Steady, Go. Um, and you, you, you can see... Um, he, he, when they, Well, the last time I saw them on the TV, they weren't the whole episodes. They were edited together. Uh, but oh, absolutely phenomenal to watch the the bands of the the time because a lot of those performances were were actually live. And Carmen Apice, a uh, drummer from Vanilla Fudge, another band I love, uh, and Cactus and Beck Bogart and Apice. And interesting story there in, in terms of when Jeff Beck was winding up his first um, group, he wanted to get together with um, uh, uh, Beck, uh, with uh, Bogart and uh, and a piece, but he had an accident and um, it put him out of action, um, so he couldn't actually uh, get together with them. Uh, so uh, they went off and formed Cactus, um, and then and that sort of ran its course. So they did get back together, and that's when Beck Bogart and a piece actually got it together. At the other end of the spectrum, the Clash, London SS bassist uh, Paul Simonon uh, was born, and in 1921. The man who coined the expression rock and roll, Alan Freed, the legendary uh, American DJ, uh, was born. Um, sadly, the, uh, the payola scandal of um, taking payments, remuner remuneration of one sort or another for playing records um, actually finished his career. But he was recognized as being uh, one of the heroes. He was inducted into the... Uh, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in the first inductions in 1986. Uh, phenomenal guy. Uh, but sadly, on the uh, 25th, uh, Johnny Ace died. He was uh, 25 years old, and he was very much a rising R&B star um, at the time. He was playing Houston. What, what year are we talking about? Uh, 1954. Oh, yeah. And he was playing in Houston with uh, Big Mama Thornton who had the original version of um, the Liebestoller Hound Dog that Elvis famously covered and tucked into the charts. And he was backstage waiting to go on. And he decided a game of Russian roulette would be a bit of fun. But sadly, he lost. He lost. And that was um, the why end did, of his why, career. Why, why would people do that? I don't know. I, I mean, could, I can only assume that he... Um, he just, I don't know, did he think there wasn't going to be anything? It was like the guy, in, the, the singer in Chicago. Yeah. Who um, he, he looked at the the uh, the, the gun carriage right. barrel and thought, oh, it's empty, and That's put right. the gun. But of course, he forgot there was one in the chamber. Exactly. You know, I mean, could yeah. it, do you think it could have been something like that? Well, I think it it must have been a bit more bravado. I, I, I've never seen a definitive um, uh, thing about. Uh, well, I don't suppose anybody really knows because there wouldn't have been too many witnesses, or 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 whether the people there thought he he thought that it was empty or not empty. But uh, whatever, whatever happened there, um, that was the end of his career. Um, but like all good careers, um, the song he just released um, became a number one, and that was uh, Pledging My Love. Uh, Johnny Ace there and uh, Pledging My Love. And that was one of the last things Elvis um, ever recorded, just before he died. Wow. In the last recording session. Yeah. I've not heard it. No. But there again, I'd never heard that before by Johnny Ace. I'd never heard of Johnny Ace before, but he, he was born four years... He, 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 uh, he died four years before I was even born, so yeah. I guess I'm forgiven. Well, he, he's, not a, he's not a particularly well-known guy. No. I mean, he, he's uh, mostly... Well, he's mostly known, but uh, he's, he's mostly famous for um, that uh, one and only game of um, Russian roulette. But it was an interesting time for um, classic American artists... Uh, if you've got a birthday on the 30th, you share it with Bo Diddley, and the 5th with Little Richard. 
it seems like everyone was born in, in December then, doesn't oh, it? It, it, it? It looks like a really good, uh, really good year. Connie Francis. What you have to say to yourself, what was happening nine months prior to the, the, all these people's birth? I mean, was it... <laughs> was lots of electricity <laughs> shortages, Yeah, yeah I, I was going to say, was it, was it a cold winter or something? Everybody went to bed early? Yeah, it must have been. <laughs> I think there must have been some serious strikes going on. Yeah. Nothing else to do. And Brenda Lee, the original Little Miss Dynamite was born on the 11th of December 1944. It was also a classic time for uh, some recording sessions. And again, you know, back in 1947 on the 28th, Winoni Harris recorded Good Rockin' Tonight, which is a staple diet of uh, rock and roll music. It was Elvis's second uh, Sun single. And in 1949 on the 10th, uh, Fats Domino recorded The Fat Man, um, which, 1949 which is often considered to be uh, a major, con well, definitely, definitely considered to be a major contender for rock, the first ever rock and roll record, as was the Domino 60 Minute Man, uh, 1950, on, recorded on the uh, 30th. Um, interesting thing about that was it was one of the first real crossover um, records that um, Alan Freed and the, uh, the likes used to, used to play that introduced white audiences to black um, R&B singers and groups. Frankie Lyman talking of black singers. Why do fools fall in love? Recorded on the fifth, nineteen fifty-five. He was the first black teenage um, idol. Sadly, uh, succumbed to uh, a little bit too many drugs. He also fell foul of um, the censors when he danced with um, a white girl on live. Uh, Alan Freed again. Very uh, hard TV to take show. that in, in it, these these days, isn't it? Because I mean, it's obviously so it, it completely ridiculous. And yeah. but how do you? It's so, well, it, it's hard, it, hard it to was it very much that, in the it? you know the Bible Belt South. Yeah. Uh, and um, to say it was frowned on, uh, you can see how much it was frowned on. Uh, I forget the uh, TV show it was on. It was one of Alan Freed's big big beats. It was called something like Alan Freed's Big Beat, and it was taken off air. It wow. finished the, the show. And all he did, uh, it was a live show, he was singing, um, and then he danced with um, a white girl. So he, he was and okay, was it. it was okay for him to be on there yeah. and to sing, yeah. but he, he couldn't to be shown to be having any kind of interaction with people of uh, different races yeah. and uh, colours. You, you just can't imagine. So can't, the, can't the culture of, of the, the moment. No, though. I mean, the, the difference is, it, this is, well, it, it's, well, it's two generations, I suppose. Mm. But it's, very much in my living uh, What year are we talking lifetime. about here? This, this is uh, 1955. Right, again, so it's, it's, it's a long time ago. Yeah. I'm glad to say things have moved on. Yeah, I mean, times have changed. They definitely have. Bill Haley and the Comets, See You Later, Our Gator, the cover of uh, Bobby Charles' song. And again, you know, you look at Bill Haley, uh, Rock Around the Clock, really kick-started kick rock and roll uh, when it was played behind the film Blackboard Jungle. But this, this, that was about six months earlier, I think it was the March of 55. Um, and this was the December of 55. It was Bill Haley's last top ten US appearance. Uh, and he, he really was the man who um, brought rock and roll to the, to the fore. But he was that little bit older than Elvis and the others, so he never really became the teenage idol that um, Elvis became. Talking of Elvis, uh, the legendary million dollar quartet got together on the 4th. They just happened to be in Sam Phillips' studio in Memphis. That's Elvis, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins and Johnny Cash. And they were just jamming together. And Sam Phillips turned on the tape and just recorded several hours of, of them just playing together. It is disputed whether Johnny Cash was actually um, there long enough to appear on the tape. Um, because it, w what happened was that um, Carl Perkins was recording, I um, can't remember exactly which one it was now, Honey Don't maybe, Jenny Lee Lewis had just joined Sun and he was the pianist on that. Um, Elvis uh, uh, dropped by and Johnny Cash was shopping. Um, so they just all happened to be in the, in the studio. But that is a good album. Uh, it's easily uh, available now. And The Crickets in Style with The Crickets, that was the first album, uh, Crickets album since, Honey, since uh, Buddy Holly's death. Uh, that was the 5th of um, December. And that has the original version of I Fought the Law, um, very much known now by The Clash, the Bobby Fuller Four, were written by Sonny Curtis, and that was back in 19, 1960. On the British side, Chas McDevitt, one of the stalwarts of the British Giffle, 
um, times was born on the on the fourth, and Tommy Steele was born on the seventeenth. It wasn't um, a good time, December, for Frank Zappa. I mean, it was good in the sense he was born on the 21st, um, 1940. Um, but in 1964, he very nearly had the very first ever rock opera. Uh, he was, he'd, he'd written part of uh, an, um, a rock opera that was uh, due to be titled I Was a Teenage Malt Shop. Um, and one of the tracks was The Birth of Captain Beefheart. Now, Don Van Fleet was working with him on this particular project. Um, but when they submitted it to um, KNXT, which was a radio sta uh, TV station, which is part of CBS, uh, one of the producers, a guy called Joseph Landis, he didn't think it was uh, good enough. So had that actually um, passed the Joseph Landis test, uh, I was a teenage malt shop, would have preceded Tommy by about half a decade. Did, you, did it actually get recorded, do you know? There are recordings. He, he hadn't written all of it, but, oh, I mean, that was one of them, The Birth of Captain Beefheart. And there are four or three or four or five um, other tracks that, um, you know, you can find um, here and there in, in rare collectible type mm. um, stuff. Um, but, I mean, that's five years before Tommy. But on the uh, the 10th in 1971, 71 really was a bad time for, for Frank. Um, on the 10th, he was pushed off the stage at the Rainbow, spent um, three or four weeks in a wheelchair and six months on crutches. Because the Rainbow, the theatre in uh, West London, um, had an orchestra pit. So he, he took a 10-foot uh, tumble. You know, he could have been, well, he was seriously injured. Um, but a week before that, he was playing Montreux Casino in Switzerland. And a fan fired a, 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 um, a flare into the ceiling, burnt the place to the ground. Now, um, the Deep Purple lads were there because they were planning to um, record some stuff um, over the next um, few weeks. But sadly, with it burning down, they had to find a new venue. Uh, but discretion being the better part of valour, when this place started to burn to the ground, they scurried back to their hotel, which was across the, the lake, and what they could see as they uh, looked over their gin and tonics um, was smoke looming over the lake, and that's how uh, they came to write smoke on the on the water. So for Frank Zappa, it's, it's and it might be the greatest riff in rock and roll, but not for Frank. It was at this uh, at, at this stage that um, uh, we were going to play it, but I, I kind of thought we've already had a twelve minute Deep Purple tonight, and it might have been overdoing it. But I could I don't know if you know this, but I was watching a little bit with uh, Richie Blackmore the other day, and he told me how the riff to "Smoke on the Water" came about. Have you have you, have you any ideas whatsoever? No. I, I still can't get my head around how he he says. You know that um, you've got Beethoven's fifth, you know, yeah. da, da 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 that sort of that, yeah? yeah. He, th he said it's just that, backwards. Oh, right. I don't believe him for a second, but yeah. he, t he assures me that's what it is. I've, I've got to get over to a piece of, uh, I've got to get hold of Beethoven's fifth, uh, and play it backwards, yeah. record it and play it backwards. And if it sounds like, duh, 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 you know, then uh, hey, you know, he's right, but I don't yeah. believe him for yeah. a second. <laughs> Well, it could be. You never know. He might have been I mean, inspired the, by the it, classics I guess, yeah. uh, often inspire yeah. uh, people. Well, he does. He's, he was saying that he, he's very into uh, classical music. Mm. Yeah, so good. Well, a lot of these guys are. A lot of uh, classical music finds its way into into rock and roll. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But it'll be fun to look at uh, Christmas in rock and roll land. And the devil doesn't have all the good music. If you look at some of the people who were born um, around Christmas Day, I mean Lemmy was born on the 24th. Uh, Pete Brown, the guy, the lyricist that worked a lot with uh, Jack Bruce in, on a lot of the Cream songs. Um, Henry Vestine played with, uh, with Zappa before Canned Heat, born on Christmas Day. Noel Redding, uh, Hendrix, uh, bass player, he was born on Christmas Day. Phil Spector, uh, legendary, uh, born on Boxing Day. Um, and Scotty Moore, um, Elvis's guitarist, born on the 27th along with uh, Lenny Kay, Patti Smith's guitarist. And one of the really sad things on the 27th, 1958, was the last ever episode of um, Six Five Special, which was the first ever uh, British rock and roll programme. Uh, get ready to jive on the old Six Five. Beach Boys uh, had a... It was some good and bad times. Brian Wilson's nervous breakdown was on the 23rd on a flight from... 
from Houston, and that was when he stopped touring, and he was replaced by Glenn Campbell, um, who, after five or six months, went off to pursue his own solo career. And it's when Bruce Johnson took the uh, the stage with um, uh, the Beach Boys. But born, Dennis was born on the 4th, and Carl was born on the 21st. But sadly, Dennis died on the 28th yeah, in a drowning accident, um, swimming around his boat. So he was very into he, he was the only surf boy, uh, beach boy who could actually surf. So it's a bit ironic, really, that he was the only one who actually drowned. Uh, but the British invasion started very much on the 26th. The Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand was released in America, and that's very much the beginning of it all, went straight to number one. It wasn't all good for the Beatles, though. On the uh, 26th, 67, Boxing Day, Magical Mystery Tour premiered on the BBC in black and white and was not well received I remember at all. that so well. Mm. I do, I really do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, 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 I mean, it wasn't the beginning of the end for them because, I mean, Pepper um, followed hot on the heels of that in the Summer of Love. But it, it was interesting that um, up until then, everything they touched turned to gold. Um, but Magical Mystery Tour didn't. It wasn't helped by the fact that it was in black and white because at that time BBC wasn't transmitting in um, in colour. And it wasn't until what a few year, days what, later. What year was it? 67? 66. Oh, 66. Sorry, 60, uh, 67. Yeah, I yeah, know. I think that's when BBC Two started. Colour, it was. It, it was shown a few days yeah. later on BBC Two in colour. Right. Um, but, you know, the va nobody watched BBC Two. It was very highbrow in those days. Um, it's a, but they, they, they carried on. They, they did really rather well as a as a band, but the Rolling Stones in um, '64 uh, put a tongue-in-cheek uh, greeting in the NME to wish all the starving hairdressers and their families a happy Christmas because that was the time that uh, the boys were starting to grow their hair, and it was the time when the parents would all say, "I can't tell if it's a boy or a girl," um, but the hairdressers obviously survived. Uh, Zeppelin did their first ever uh, U.S. tour. 1968 and they started off supporting Vanilla Fudge and Spirit now interestingly enough um, Spirit had just released their first LP imaginatively called um, Spirit and it's um, included the track Taurus which the 1971 Stairway to Heaven found itself uh, in litigation with um, very recently but they uh, obviously spent um, some time listening to that every night of the week I'm sure it didn't influence them um, Elvis abandoned his um, karate movie and Phil Spector produced, released the greatest Christmas album of all time. Not my view, that's Brian, Joan, Brian Wilson's view of the Beach Boys. He reckons it's the best LP ever. Rolling Stone magazine has it as 142 in its list of the best 500 albums ever, not just Christmas albums. Um, it is a superb album, a Christmas gift for you. And this is Darlene Love with Christmas. Christmas, baby, please come home. Uh, Darlene Love there and uh, Christmas, baby, please come home. It's good. Actually, I don't mind playing that because it is Christmas. I wouldn't play it otherwise. Though. Well, no. No, because we just have a little off-air chat, as we do, and we're allowed to, you know, a little off-air chat. And uh, not for me at all, that sound. Just, oh, I love it. Yeah, no, but each for their, you know, that's 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 the great thing about yeah. music, isn't it? Um, you know, some things you like, some things you don't. I just don't get that wall of sound sort of yeah. sound. It yeah. just doesn't do it for me at all. It's uh, it's too much. There's too much there. It's like too much going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, interesting. That's Darlene Love, um, and uh, Spectre was at the time people would talk about the new Phil Spectre single. They wouldn't talk about the new Ronettes um, or the new Crystal single. Um, and his artists were very much um, interchangeable in his own mind. That particular album was released on the 22nd of November, uh, which is the day that uh, John F. Kennedy was uh, assassinated. It didn't actually do very well at the time. It's, it's, it's become, like a lot of these things, it's become very much a, a classic in, um, in retrospect. But again, rolling on with um, some more um, Christmas, December birthdays, Johnny Otis... Uh, was born on the um, on the twenty eighth. He was the guy that had the uh, formed the the Battle House um, Club, and it's uh, was the first um, club to um, be dedicated to R and B music. And when Alexis Corner and Siddle Davis decided to move from skiffle to um, uh, blues in the UK, uh, they called their uh, club the the Battle House Club after Johnny Otis. I mean, Johnny Otis was a writer, he was a band leader, he was a drummer, 
Um, uh, he he discovered um, talent uh, for people. I mean, he he, he was um, one of the guys that was really a, a major player of his time. And Phil Oakes, the uh, folk singer, was born on the 19th of December, 1940. Not as well known as, um, I think, like as well known as um, Bob Dylan. But if you, if you haven't come across Phil Oakes and you like Dylan, I mean, check him out. Um, some of the stuff he does is absolutely amazing. Sadly, he died by his own hand um, in the 70s. Um, Alvin Lee, we heard earlier, um, was born on the on the 19th. I saw uh, saw him at the uh, the Isle of Wight in 1970, and afterward, and that was the one with Hendrix, John Byers, um, ELP's debut, and oh, just about anybody who was anybody at the time was was there. The Who, The Doors. Um, and afterwards, I was thinking, no, I need an album to remember that by, and it was the um, Ten Years After album that I bought because it had a live version of um, one of the Chuck Berry songs, uh, Schoolgirl, I think, uh, on it, and I thought, yes, that's got to be one. That was the band that impressed me um, the most. I remember thinking at the time that uh, Jimi Hendrix seemed a little subdued, not realising, of course, that he'd be dead a couple of months later. Uh, but, uh, wow, that was, uh, that was three days and a half. And Paul Rogers, uh, we heard earlier as well, with, uh, with Free. He was born on the, on the 17th. And David O'List, the uh, guitarist with uh, mostly remembered for, for Nice, um, he was born on the, um, on the 13th. He actually stood in for Sid Barrett on the Hendrix tour uh, when Sid Barrett was um, unavailable to uh, appear live on stage for one reason or another. And Elvis, um, on, this, on the 29th, in 1956, had 10 singles on Billboard's um, Top 100. Um, he, he'd only just um, moved to, well, that year, the beginning of the year, moved to um, RCA, at least Heartbreak Hotel. And by the end of the year, he was, well, he was the man. Uh, he recently released Love Me Tender, which was the highest one, at number two, on um, that Christmas week, and uh, I mean, a bunch of them. Old Shep, any Fools and Horses fans uh, will recognise from uh, a classic Fool and, Fools and Horses um, episode. Hound Dog was there as well, talking of um, uh, earlier earlier times. And he also, in uh, 1968, on the 3rd of December, he, he produced his uh, comeback special. Because what had happened, Elvis had three very distinctive careers. Uh, the first one, uh, the rock and roll star. They went in the army, came back, and his manager, Colonel Parker, decided he'd become a matinee idol. So for the 60s, he was pumping out two or three movies a year, all of which made a lot of money, most of which aren't rated very highly. Um, but his career carried on. Uh, but in 68, just he finished the movies in 69, um, he, he made what was effectively his first live performance um, for, well, almost a decade almost. Um, and it, it marked very much him returning to touring. He started touring soon after, and uh, he st uh, went into his famous residencies at, uh, in Las Vegas, and that was the third um, era. So having been a matinee idol in the 60s, he became the ultimate cabaret act of the, of the 1970s. And on the 21st of December 1970, believe it or not, um, he met President Nixon, um, because he wanted to become a drugs enforcement officer. Um, and there, there is a piece of uh, classic memorabilia floating around, you can find pictures of up on the great um, place in the sky, um, handwritten on American Airlines paper, basically saying, um, please can I pop along and see you because I'd like to become a drugs enforcement officer. Now President Nixon agreed to this, and Elvis in return gave him a, um, a commemorative World War II Colt 45 um, pistol as a sort of present. So Elvis was an official badge carrying drugs enforcement guy. And that it got I, I wonder if he ever arrested anyone. <laughs> Should have arrested himself, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but the Stones, it was, it was a fun time for the Stones. Uh, some birthdays there. I mean, Alan Klein, their manager, who uh, the Stones end up suing, the Beatles end up suing, he was born on the 18th in 31, and Keith Richard was born on the 18th in 1943. Carlo, uh, Carlo Little. The drummer, a regular drummer with them before Charlie Watts joined, and a famous drummer of the time, played with people like uh, Lord Such, 
He was born on the 17th. And Daryl Jones, the guy that replaced Bill Wyman um, in the mid-late uh, 1990s, was born on the 11th. Sadly, Ian Stewart died on the on the 12th. Um, he, he was uh, a, part of the original uh, Rolling Stones. Uh, but Andrew Lou Golden, when he became their, well, their second manager, decided he didn't have the right image. So he was removed from uh, the stage to um, being the, uh, the road manager. But he did play an awful lot of their albums. And Pete Townsend, Swing in Arm Motion, comes from a time in 1963, 22nd, when they were called the Detours, and they uh, were waiting in the wings, watching the Stones about to go on stage. And before the curtain went up, um, Keith Richard brought his arm down in the classic um, arc. The P and Pete Townsend thought, ooh, I'll have a bit of that. And it became uh, uh, Pete Townsend's trademark. Rock and Roll Circus, on the, recorded on the 11th, 1968, was the Rolling Stones' idea of a Christmas special. Um, featured uh, a band called Dirty Mac with Winston Legthigh, who was also John Lennon, uh, Clapton, Mitch Mitchell and Keith Richard on bass. Um, but it generally thought at the time that um, Mick Jagger had thought that The Who um, outperformed them. So it was never released at the time. It did find its way out on a DVD around... Um, uh, well, by the end of the 1990s. Tony Iommi was was with Jethro Tull very, very briefly, but just long enough to uh, perform in that rock and roll circus. Uh, Black Sabbath were called Earth at that stage, and that was um, briefly um, a, a sort of sabbatical from Earth uh, before, just before they became Black Sabbath. But I think the spiritual end of the 1960s came on the 6th, 1969, at the Altamont um, Festival. It was the end of the Stones' legendary tour. It technically wasn't part of the tour. They wanted to give a free concert because that was what life was like in 1969. Um, and the, uh, uh, the venue wasn't originally planned to be Altamont, but they couldn't get planning permission um, for the original venue, so they moved to a speedway track. Um, and they decided to use uh, Hell's Angels as security because the previous July, I think, um, at Hyde Park, the Rolling Stones concert there, they'd used Hell's Angels. It had all gone rather well, not realising that the sort of San Francisco um, Hell's Angels weren't really quite the same cup of tea as your North London um, Hell's Angels. And it all got really out of hand. Uh, Grateful Dead actually refused to, um, to go on. Marty Balin of um, Jefferson Airplane was KO'd by one of them, and the violence escalated across the day, partly because the Hell Hell's Angels were being paid in uh, cases of beer, rather than folding, um, I was going to say pound notes, but it would be dollar notes, obviously. Um, and Alan uh, Passero, one of the angels, uh, stabbed to death uh, Meredith Hunter, famously. Um, but I mean, Meredith Hunter was about five or six rows in, uh, from very close to the stage, and you, it can be seen in documentaries at the time, that he was holding a, a gun. Um, so whether, well, Passero was, was tried and uh, acquitted of murder. So obviously the judge and jury decided that um, it was well justified. But for me, uh, the Rolling Stones song that's uh, from that uh, Let It Bleed era, because that Let It Bleed had just been released, Gimme Shelter, one of the best things they ever did. Uh, the uh, Rolling Stones are at their absolute finest. Uh, I actually didn't know. We, me and Derek were just having a chat again, as we do, and uh, we didn't know who was doing the vocals there. We just couldn't remember her name, so I, I did have to look it up. Mary Clayton. And uh, quite coincidentally, uh, born on Christmas Day, 1948. So many good things at yes, Christmas. But what a voice. Absolutely. What amazing. a wonderful voice. That track um, is just, it conjures up such a wonderful atmosphere, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's brilliant, that track. Absolutely superb, you know. I, I don't know, you write something like that. Where have they dragged that up from? I don't know. You don't get many songs like that in this You life. don't, indeed, you don't. But talking of this life, I mean, people who joined it um, in December 1949, Tom Waits, the Too Many Cigarettes and uh, Bourbon singer, superb guy, Greg Ullman on the 8th, Zal, Zal Janowski, guitarist with a loving spoonful, what a band, he was born on the 19th, and Del Shannon, born on the 30th, and December's quite an interesting one for me, because on the 13th, a group called Cleo's Mood, 
uh, was uh, being formed by myself and some uh, school buddies. I had a brief flirtation with a bass guitar, decided I wasn't enjoying that all that much, and decided the drums looked a lot of fun, so I took up the drums, and one of life's good you're, you're decisions. you're built like a drummer, aren't Absolutely. you? You definitely are. You've got, you've, got the, you've got the clout to hit those sticks. Prop forward drum, drummer. <laughs> hey, it's all there. Drink pints of beer. And uh, that was the... So we took our name from... Uh, uh, Junior Walker and the All-Stars track, Cleo's Move. We'd never heard it. We just thought it sounded really cool. This is 1963. But 1999, uh, on the 14th of December, Paul McCartney played the the, uh, the Cavern. Now, in interestingly enough, uh, when the book Rock and Roll Unraveled uh, was released, we launched it at the Cavern. And uh, and a merry time was had by all. Oh, it was, it well, was a lot didn't of fun. Didn't we? Oh, we loved it. Oh, it was brilliant. And I was actually playing in a band. My brother's got a band, and I was playing drums with them. Um, so in between talking about the book and the presentation, uh, it was punctuated by uh, live music. Uh, so I, I would then uh, nip back to the back of the stage, jump on a rather nice drum kit provided uh, by the cavern, um, and play on that very same stage. Now, that was one of life's good experiences. Talking of the book... There is a superb um, opportunity in East Grinstead tomorrow at the bookshop in East Grinstead tomorrow between 11 and 3 o'clock when I will be there in person um, signing copies of said book. So please um, pop along, have a chat about rock and roll. And if you're looking for a Christmas present for somebody who likes music, you will love it. Rock and roll and revel. And I'll tell you what you can do, dear listener. Uh, I'm not, pro you know, there's no prize for this or anything like that, but uh, go along to the bookstore uh, tomorrow between 11 and uh, 3 and uh, try and catch Derek out. Try and think of a question, a musical question, and try and, I mean, not like, you know, like your own band, that kind of thing, but try and. Can't try and catch him out with something because he'll, he'll be pleased. He will be pleased if Absolutely. you can catch him out with something because he, all he'll do is write it down and he'll add it to the next book when that comes out in another seven years' time. Well, exactly. <laughs> I've already uh, got several ideas of things because, I mean, there's just so much knowledge out there. But please, yeah, do come along. And, you know, I do record fairs um, as, a, as a dealer and you, people who are very, very specialist in the areas come up and fi I find I learn a lot every time I go to a fair, which is brilliant. It, thinking now about uh, punk, it was, uh, Sex Pistols really getting underway. Uh, on the 1st of um, December 1976, they appeared on the Bill Grundy show, very famously, and towards the end of the interview, they had a couple of minutes going, and Bill Grundy was goading them to um, say something controversial, say something controversial, and Steve Jones couldn't resist it, and said the, uh, the very naughty um, F word resulted immediately in uh, Bill Grundy being sacked from the programme. The um, Anarchy in the UK book tour was kicking off a few days later, and of about the 30 gigs that were due to take place, most were cancelled. Um, but UK Punk and the Sex Pistols were firmly um, on the map. Now, on the 28th, 1976, Buzzcocks released um, Spiral Scratch, um, an EP, and it was on their New Hormones, their own uh, record label. It was very early days for uh, for independent record labels. But I thought it'd be fun to hear uh, the Buds Buzzcocks ever fallen in ever fallen in love with someone you shouldn't have. I'm sure we all have, surely. It, we've all been there. Oh, we definitely <laughs> have. The Buzzcocks, of course. And uh, have you ever fallen in love with someone you shouldn't have fallen in love with? Definitely, without a doubt. I do it all the time. I only have to look in the mirror. Exactly. Oh, no, I think that's permitted. <laughs> I think that's permitted. But uh, no, no look at December could be complete without a quick look at um, New Year's Eve, you know, the, the end of the month. Andy Summer was, Summers was born. Um, be, with the uh, Zoot Money, big roll band Dantillion's Chariot before the police, MC5 played their last ever gig at the Grand Ballroom in Detroit, which was the venue's last ever gig. Def Le Leppard, uh, Rick Allen lost his arm in a car crash, but three years later came back uh, with hysteria and went 12 platinum. And the small faces, Steve Marriott, stormed off stage at the Alexander pa uh, Palace. And it wasn't actually the end of the small faces that particular uh, night. Uh, but shortly after, he went off with uh, Peter Frampton, Greg Ridley, Spooky Tooth, and formed Humble Pie. 
Rod Stewart and uh, Ron Wood uh, joined, became the faces, but this is the small faces, all or nothing. The uh, small faces there and uh, all or nothing, but that's it. Uh, another three hour extravaganza is gone. Uh, Derek, uh, thank you so much for coming in and uh, providing us with all that uh, amazing uh, information. My pleasure, I really enjoyed it, Dave. Look forward to next time. Any ideas what we're going to do? Any thoughts waving? You don't have to sort of say. I'm not going to quite put you on the spot. I guess it's not fair, but uh, we'll, we'll come up with something. We, we'll yeah, I think, I think the uh, gem of an idea is um, definitely there. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Derek, will be back in a month's in a month's time. I'll be back next week. My guest should be Guy Snowden, providing he didn't get dragged off to Dublin again. Uh, coming up to the eleven o'clock news. Thanks for listening. Good night.